We're in this book of Philemon. We're going to break it down into uh, three sermons. We had the introduction last week, took the first seven verses. I'm going to take the middle section uh, this morning, and Brother Tyler Branham is going to wrap us up uh, next week with the end of the passage. So thankful uh, for him. You know, there are, um, there are times uh, as, a, as a child, and now being a parent and having a child, that I would use this strategy, and then I see my kids using it, that it starts like this. Dad, you're the best dad. <laughs> you are so kind and good. I'm so glad you're my dad. And you know, though, that conversation, anybody, either, you've either experienced it or led it. Okay? Yeah, and, and what comes after that? An ask. A can I. Right? And, and so it's really the, the buttering up to make a request or to make a, ask a question or, or maybe it's to admit something. <laughs> um, but here we found this is what Paul is doing at the first section. Last week we, we, we studied the section where Paul is saying, you're the best dad. All right? He's talking to Philemon who uh, lives in Colossae, um, and Paul is in prison in Rome, and he's talking to Philemon, who was a master, and he, he owned a slave at that time, and the slave's name was Onesimus. Onesimus had uh, escaped and ran away from Philemon all the way to Rome, and met Paul, got saved. Long story. We're going to talk about it more in a minute. But here, Paul is writing this letter back to Philemon, and he, and he sends Onesimus with the letter back to him. Okay, and, and so he's saying, he starts in the, this mic's going in now, the first part of this, the chapter, and he's saying, Philemon, you have such a beautiful heart. You're such a refresher of all the Lord's people. Like he is telling him all these good things. He's buttering up. He's saying, you share in the gospel. Your good works exhibit so much of what the gospel's done in your life. I see this in you. And so this week we're on verse 8 where Paul makes the ask. This is what he's asking from Philemon. As I was talking to Tyler on Friday and asking him if he'd be willing to preach next week, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here. I'm not going to be gone. I just love to hear Tyler preach. And, um, and I love for you all to hear different people preach other than me because the power is in the gospel. It's in the scripture. And so I'm excited for him to, to share the last section of this, this letter next week. But he was saying, yeah, you got this section. This is James 2. This is James 2 right here. And anybody know what? Uh, uh, some of you are going to know a verse from the book of James, and it's from James 2. Anybody can quote the verse? Faith without works is dead. And so Paul is in here. I see the fruit of the gospel in your life, and here's this extra opportunity to see even more evidence of the fruit of your life that the gospel has disrupted your heart and changed your whole life. I'm going to ask you to do something you thought you would never do. There are things in your life right now you're saying, I would never. Or this will never happen. Like if somebody asks you and you start talking, it's like, oh, no, yeah, I believe God could do that. He could restore that relationship. He could do this. But you, you don't really live like it. <laughs> And you say, he could, but he won't. And you just accepted something in your life that's never going to be different. Maybe it's a struggle with your own sin. You think you're never going to be able to get over that. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a strained relationship. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. And you think, it's done. It can never come back. And so we have in this story, uh, uh, Onesimus comes back with this letter from Paul, and he's looking at Philemon. And Philemon is reading this letter while he's looking at Onesimus. You've got to understand the context of this. Because Onesimus, when he showed back up, usually in those times, he would be killed. That's what Philemon would normally do to a runaway slave that shows back up on his doorstep. He has the right to kill him. But things are getting ready to be different. So let's look at the passage, Philemon, no chapter, remember? There's, no, there's one chapter, so there's just verses Starting in Philemon 8 through 9. We're going to look at four headings this morning. We're going to look at, um, at, at first we're going to look at Paul's proposal, his plea to Philemon. We're going to look at God's providence. We're going to look at God's provision. And then we're going to look at a thing called privilege. Four Ps 
If anybody loves some enumeration, there you go. So first, we're going to look here in this first passage at uh, this first verse in this section. We're going to look at Paul's proposal to Philemon. He says, therefore, so remember, all before this is you're the best dad, you're all this. You're good, good, you're good, you're good, you're good. You got this heart, you're a refresher of the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He, is, he, he begins with this proposal to Philemon, and he says this. He says, hey, all my other letters, I usually say Paul, an apostle sent by Jesus Christ. I have ultimate authority here given to me by God. And so I'm telling you, Philemon, you need to accept Onesimus back. He had the authority to say that, but he says, I'm not, he says, I'm not going to do that. I could do this with authority, but I want to appeal on the basis of love. I want to appeal on the basis of love. All right, what does this look like? So I've started talking about kids, and, and, and so let's talk about a teenager right now. You got a chore. It's doing the dishes. Not like when I was a kid when you actually had to do the dishes. All you got to do is get them out of the dishwasher, <laughs> right? Or put them in. So that's, that's the chore. So at, at parents out there, which would you rather have? Teenagers out there, I'm getting ready to give you a secret to success in life and making your parents happy. Okay? You ready? Okay, so parents, which would you rather have? Here's teenager one. Teenager one, it's their chore to do the dishes. And so they do the dishes like this. <sighs> God, I'm doing the dishes. <laughs> mm, dishes. Could be doing so many other things. Friends are on TikTok. Right? You got that. All right? And some of you have that child. Some of you were that child. Some of you are that child. <laughs> the other child is this. They don't have the chore to do the dishes. It's not their responsibility. Nobody told them they have to. But mom and dad have cooked a big dinner, and it was great, and now all the dishes are dirty, and this child walks in and is like, I know my chore isn't doing the dishes, mom and dad. But you work so hard. Like, I really... <laughs> appreciate that meal you just made and and like from the bottom of my heart I would love to wash the dishes I don't know but here, here's the secret because here's what I would do as a dad when if my daughter did that I'd be like baby that's so sweet don't worry about it I'll do the dishes that's the secret all right teenagers you see, because this, this, this is the principle that Paul is getting to here. This is the principle that Paul is getting to here with Philemon. God seeks our heartfelt. Our heartfelt, our genuine, and when we sing about gratitude, out of gratitude for the gospel and God wrecking our life and changing us and, and pulling us out of darkness and putting us in light, out of the fact that we know he left the 99 righteous and came and found me in a ditch somewhere in the mud, right? I was that sheep that was lost. Out of, out of knowing that, that he, he says, Paul is saying, Philemon, man, you, you got the gospel. I know you're going to want to do this. Because me telling you you have to and you just doing it is not what God wants. God wants a genuine and a heartfelt, not grudging obedience. So if you're still living life trying to make God happy by the way you live, if you're just going to church because you've been told to go to church, if you, if, you think, if you think you're just doing it right out of peer pressure or all these things, God, God like... That gets you here, and you hear the gospel, and you're missed people. But if God wants you who are longing deep in your heart to be in his presence. That wants you to bear fruit because you've understood how much he loves you. And Romans, Paul said, is the kindness of God that draws man to repentance. It is the fact that if you still think God is a bad God, mean God, angry God, you don't understand who God is. And when you understand the kindness and the love of God for, for a humanity that turned their back completely upon him, yet he died for them anyway. 
that gave you hope of eternity with him, then you, with all your heart, want to do the dishes. Are you with me for a minute? This is what God is looking for in us. He desires this heartfelt, not grudging obedience. He says, Then I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I got to say this here we find just an element of God's providence that continues on to verse 15. First, we see Paul's proposal. He's asking Philemon, like, hey, I want you to consider this. You've got an opportunity to live out your faith right now. Some of you right now have an opportunity to live out your faith in some good deeds and works. So Paul's asking him that. He says, I want you to see the providence, Philemon. He says, I appeal you for my son Onesimus. See, I, I believe that, that there was probably a point when uh, Philemon and his wife who usually in that home and that culture at the time, if they would have had a slave, the, the wife would have been really the, kind of the CEO and told, given directions and orders. And so I think Philemon and his wife were probably sitting down at some point after, after Onesimus left and ran away, and, and, and they probably said this word, these words, they probably said, we'll never see Onesimus again. He gone. Like, he ain't coming back. We're never going to see him again. It's just time to move on. And so there, there's, there's things in our life that we will say they're never going to be. And yet we find here with Onesimus, he runs away. I showed this map last week. I don't have time to spend much time there. But just know, if he would have had Google Maps and an iPhone and a car, it would have taken him 29 hours to get to Rome where he ran to. Rem was the most populated place in the, the known world at the time. He was running away to hide. He thought he, and Onesimus thought, I'll never be seen again. I will never see Philemon again. I'm out of that place, and, and I'm gone. And somehow he gets to Rome, and we see the providence of God that somehow, I don't, we don't know the backstory. We don't know how... Onesimus ends up near the jail cell where Paul is, and Paul leads him to the faith. We don't know how that happens, but I, I tell you this, that God was in the middle of it. You don't run all the way to Rome, and you get there and happen to meet the guy who led your former master that you ran from to Christ. That's a big place. You know what I mean? And, and so I want you to just take this, and I want you to think about it just for a minute. Runaways, God loves runaways, chases you. you never make, they never make it to their destination. Runaways never make it to their destination. What do I mean by that? He made it to Rome, but he never made it away from God. Some of you spent, have spent your whole life running from God. And there became some point in Onesimus' life that as he was running to Rome and he began to look around and he saw his circumstance, how God was working through people in his life and he met Paul and he began to think, wait, man, is this God real? Could Jesus really be the Messiah? And he, and he saw that even though he was running as hard as he could, that God was pursuing him. That even though Jonah made it down and he got a ticket and he got on the ship and it felt like it was all going well when he was running from God, he, you, we find that he was not out of the presence of God. We find that the disciples in the garden right before Jesus is captured, that they, uh, they just they flee, they're gone. They're like, whoa, I'm out at this point. I thought you were going to be king, not die. They ran, but they never escaped his presence. I want you to just, if you're in that place of running away, maybe you're a believer and you're just starting to question and you've grown slow in your faith or weak in your faith and, and less commitment and you've been thinking, you've been doing your own things. I want you to know, I want you to look. I want you to really see the circumstances that God is doing in your life. I promise he's there if you'll open your eyes to him. Those of you who are just maybe spent your whole life, you've never given Christ your life, I want you to see, I mean, right now, it's pretty obvious he is sharing truth with you. That you are in this place and it's not by an accident. He loves you. We see this providence here. Runaways never make it to their destination. 
Paul goes on to say, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Here again, he's looking for this heartfelt desire to let the gospel live out in his life. Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Here, again, providence. Paul pondering the great mind of God like maybe Philemon, this thing that you thought was the worst thing that had ever happened to you, that this slave ran away and stole from you, is actually God working to his and your good. So you can take that and, and, and just... Put it onto your life and say, this is the best, the worst thing that I think has ever happened to me. This is the worst thing and this is the, the bad thing about my situation right now. And we have to keep believing in, in Romans 8 where, where Paul wrote to the church that God is working all things together for the good of those that are, loved, that are called by him and love him. And so even in that bad thing, God saying, Paul saying, look at the providence. Man. God, you thought it was bad, but he's bringing you back. And so we see the provision here in that Philemon had probably said, I'll never see Onesimus again. And now he's not just going to see him. He says he's coming back no longer a slave, but better than a slave. He didn't just restore it back to what you thought was impossible, Philemon. He, he brought you back a new brother in Christ. Not just go back to the way things were. It's better. It's wrecking your life. You see, that's the thing that God can do with your never. You can say, I'll never break this addiction. He said, oh, no, I'll break it, and you're going to lead other people out of it. He's going to say, I'll never be able to recover from the, the broken marriage I was in and what happened to me. God said, oh, no, I'm going to use that as a story to show how I can bring beauty from ashes. And so all these things you're going to put never on, God says, don't put never on it. Because he's a God who's able to do more than we can imagine. That's Ephesians 3.20. Paul was praying to him and said, he's, more than we, he's able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And so he says he's no longer a slave, but better than that, he's a dear brother. You see, this is how the gospel began, began to disrupt a broken structure and system of slavery. It was one heart at a time. All of a sudden, the masters found Christ and they thought, and Paul said, you should pay your slaves what is due. And they became employees. And one at a time, and they, he taught slaves, that now you're going to be an employee. And this is your employer, and you have respect. And, and, and he began to, the gospel began to disrupt that whole system, this idea that we could own other people. Not through politics and votes, but by the gospel, one heart and truth at a time. So we see this provision here as God begins to disrupt labels. And we see labels in our own community, in our own church, in our own place. And this is, was a, a quote from the, uh, uh, the, one of my study Bibles and commentary about this passage. It says, like a wrecking ball taken to ter tear down a building, the gospel tears down the sin barrier between us and God. Reconciling our relationship. So right, the gospel... Breaks down that barrier between us and God. No longer separated, we can be reconciled and reunited with him. And because of that relationship with God, it begins to tear down the walls of social classes and divisions one to another. Are you with me for a minute? He said, I don't want you to call that guy slave anymore. And you said, well, do we do labels around here? Sure we do. All the way down to, you know... Um, Hear old people say this, these young people, <laughs> divided. You with me? In the church, you say that one time, and you've divided the kingdom. You young people say, them old people, <laughs> all right? <coughs> we'll say, them, them city people, they're from Pikeville. <laughs> I'm a county person. I can't go to church with impossible people. All of a sudden, we put a label. 
all that comes with some connotation and something we could write out and what we think about those people, and it's usually not positive. We could say, man, those, those people that live up on the hill, in that gated community, those wealthy people, you know, they don't, they don't know what I'm going through. The very people up on the hill, they, they're saying, these people, I don't, know how, I don't know why they can't get it together. Homeless people, it's ridiculous. Find a house. You think that doesn't exist? And here we find that the gospel can throw those labels away. Actually, I believe it's garbage to the gospel. That would, we would differentiate between each other in that way. He can, and we might say, but they're just uh, they're, they're that druggy. And we say that about someone until it hits our own family. It's our own child or brother or parent or sibling. A druggie's got a name. <laughs> Don't need a label. And, and, and so here he says, I'm going to take it from slave to brother. Maybe you, it changes from, from druggy or addict to brother or sister. You begin to see and think about where that person is in life and what's happened. And this is how God begins to break divisions down. And it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important that the church be in unity. And, and so we see this, and, and out of this comes this thought, privilege. Um, and, and privilege just means we have some inherent, you have some inherent advantages that many of us in this room have. You've got some. You've got some inherent advantages. Some of you are, you received just by birth. You were born in America. You have certain advantages you were born into that would be known as your privilege. You didn't do anything to earn it. Just the fact that you live in America, there are people lined up walking thousands of miles trying to just get one hope stab at what you were born with. And we just walk around like, Wi-Fi don't work. <laughs> right? And so we have this privilege. Some things that we're born into, maybe it's the family that you were born into. Uh, 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 maybe it was the community you were born into. Uh, maybe you were born into money. Maybe you were born into, and maybe it's the other side. You think, I was born into addiction and abuse and brokenness, and, 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 and so, but, but we all have this privilege, this benefit that we all have. We have some, some we've earned by merit. Maybe we've gone to school, and you've got a degree, or you're a doctor, or you're an attorney, and you've got, you've got some privilege at that, with, with that merit. Maybe it's by rank, you've been promoted, or you've got a certain title, and you have, as a teacher, you have some privilege. You get to speak into children's lives. And so what, what, I'm, what I want to say is I don't want you to feel guilty for having privilege. It is a blessing. It is a benefit. I'm not saying it's a bad thing that you have it. It's a bad thing sometimes when we pretend like we don't. But here's what I want to ask, and this is really the question that I have, is what are you doing with your privilege? What are you doing with your privilege because this is what Paul was doing with his he was an apostle he was taking time to write a letter and vouch for a slave that deserved to be shot and he was using his privilege for the benefit of Onesimus he was asking Philemon yeah, I know you have the authority and the right to do what you want to with Onesimus. You have the privilege to do that. But I'm asking you, as the gospel has wrecked your heart and Jesus has wrecked your heart, I'm going to ask you to use that privilege to make the gospel real to Onesimus right now. As he's standing there, you think about that moment when Onesimus has delivered the letter and Philemon is reading it and maybe glancing up every now and looking at him and Onesimus not knowing him. Am I going to make it through this? Is he going to accept this? Is he not? And this is really important because there was a man named Jesus in Philippians 2. We find out that he had immense privilege. That he was on the throne as the king in heaven. And he could have used his privilege as king to stay in heaven forever. 
And yet he made it his decision to surrender himself and his, his privilege and become a servant. So as he asked this, a flame, he says, You're very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man, as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, if you, you all got some relationships with people that you could help some other people out with. Are you with me for a minute? You got some people that trust you, that don't trust somebody else, that you could vouch for, that you could bring under your wing, that you could mentor, that you could help, that you could teach. He said, if you could, listen, this is Paul writing to you, Philemon, I ask you to trust me. Welcome this Onesimus as you would welcome me. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? Doesn't that sound like what Jesus is going to say when we get to heaven? Father, if I'm your son... They are in me. Would you welcome them as you would welcome me? They're mine. So what does this mean? I'm closing right now. Um, we've been talking about Christmas on the bypass, and we got this building over uh, the auto parts store over on uh, beside the boxing gym. You've heard us sharing about it. i got some pictures. That's Jerry Justice. He's not here right now. He's in the first service. I couldn't find one without him in it. So <laughs> he got a good kick out of that. He said, you didn't tell him. I was only three weeks out of knee surgery when I was there working. So there you go. I shared that for Jerry. He was there working three weeks out of knee surgery. We got this building, and I know it's completely God's providence that we're there, and so it's fun for me to be in the middle of these projects and just look around and see how God is working and what he's doing. And so this building, a quick story, we had this middle school team that was here volunteering, doing mission work when we got the boxing gym two years ago, two and a half years ago. They were cleaning out apartments underneath, and it was nasty, as nasty as you can imagine. These kids, they had hit a, hit a piece of sheetrock, and if 10 bugs came out, a million came out. It was like, it was just, you know, you just have to have been there. Um, and one of, the, one of the middle schoolers, he walks out and they stand up front and we had shared the vision of Mayfield over there and the community center and things that were happening. And uh, I said, we just don't know where we're going to do the, the other things that he had envisioned. He looks over at this part store building, it's right beside, he's like, that'd be a great place for a youth center or a community center. And I was like, yeah, well, they still own it, and we, we don't know how that's going to work out. And they're trying to, they tried to sell it to us for two years after we bought the gym. Uh, and when I say we, I'm talking about the church. Yes, this church owns a boxing gym. Um, and so I didn't know, but, you know, we now own that building. And, and literally while I was uh, that little boy, he's a prophet. <laughs> what I figured out. While he was saying that to me, see, when we bought the boxing gym, the attorney made a mistake and transferred that building with us, with it. So while he was saying that to me, and I was saying, I don't know, if I, I we'll never own that building is what I was thinking. God was saying, oh, Jared, <laughs> y'all already own it, you know. And, um, and so God began to just work in so many providential ways. You know, uh, 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 this is mind-blowing. We had mission teams from all kinds of different churches come and work on that building. This was not planned. One of them is sitting here this morning <laughs> from Medway Christian Church in Ohio. Like, I mean, so God begins to send mission teams and we start working on this building and um, that, that's before on the left, after on the right. I believe God's doing something in that space. I believe what we would normally say, the bypass, many of you would think that's the other part of town. God says there's no other part of town. And so I believe God's doing some of that place to just rebuild some relationships between groups and class and community. And I think it's incredibly important. I don't realize that as we take these steps through it, and it, it's messy, man. The property taxes have been crazy. The deed's crazy. All this stuff is crazy. And I just begin to think, God, God what are you doing? How are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And so David, uh, David Thingelstad, he's not here today. He's, um, uh, but it's Glenna's husband. You know, we, Glenna came on and as our uh, ministry coordinator and administrative assistant, and he started coming with her occasionally. I was like, man, this is great. 
And so he's incredibly gifted. So he's began overseeing a lot of the, the, the project over there at the parts store. Um, we were able to get a grant from the Pikeville Community Foundation for $30,000. First, they gave us fifteen, and they said, if you can raise another fifteen, we will give you another fifteen. All right, this is how God has worked all throughout this process. So I thought, all right, we've got to raise $15,000 to get another fifteen. And uh, this was the summer. We were on vacation in July. I get a call from one of the board members from the Community Foundation who is also a board member of this other foundation called the Roops Family F Foundation. And she says, hey, I talked to Roops, and they're going to give you the 15 to match that first. Fi See, I was on vacation. <laughs> God works while I'm on vacation. I didn't even have to try. I didn't have to make a call. And God raised this money for this space. And, and so, you know, listen, eight years of us doing this work and following God, there's many times it's, we're living week to week like you all. It's not like we got money stacked up places. God has provided every step of the way. And I can see the runway of what we have right now, and I see the end of it, and I'm like, I don't know from there. Like, that's a drop in the bucket to take a, a building that's been ignored for a decade and bring it back to life. So we, we've started doing it. And, um, and so we, we've taken signs down. The city had $30,000 of fines and environmental fees on it. Gone, thanks to mission teams and people that have helped step up, do the work over there. You all helped on a Serve Sunday. Uh, top on the right is what it looked like before inside and what it looked like after. Uh, so this Christmas on the bypass is not just a thing we're doing. This is something God is doing. I don't know how he's going to use it, but it's going to be powerful and it's important. And this is a video David sent. He just sent it to me to give me an update this week because we got heat in that building this week. So we're just going to enjoy it. I actually cried over an HVAC. Now, first it. You hear the sound of the return. Fancy door on the Look at that. Man, it makes me so happy. Man, it's blowing hot air. Such a simple thing. And they're going to come back once the ceiling is done to put in the new grills. This space is, um, it's come so far, but we got a way to, ways to go. You all are the best church. <laughs> the... Such good Christians. <laughs> I would like to appeal in the name of love. <laughs> Why is this important? John 17, 21. You know Jesus prayed for you? Prayed for me? He prayed for his disciples, and then right after this, he says, not only just you, I'll pray for everybody who will ever believe in me. I pray that you will all be one just as you and I are one as you are in me Father and I am in you and may they be in us that means and may Jared be in us so that the world will believe you sent, it, sent me see the, the unity of what is coming through what's happening over there it's simply so there's some people over there will know that God the Father sent Jesus and that he was the Messiah and that that will only be made known through the unity of believers. 